Michael Jackson, a man of many faiths. Welcome to Sound the Norms. My name is Kenneth Muir Tour. Regardless of one's opinion of Michael Jackson and his contributions to this world system through his musical enterprise, he was a man of many faiths. Michael Jackson purported to have been raised as a Jehovah's Witness, married a Scientologist, and his brother wanted him to convert to Islam. Whatever faith Michael Jackson was in life, it's clear there's no scriptural evidence he was of the Christian faith. The very first evidence of Christian faith is confession with one's mouth, then water baptism as an outward sign of your death with Christ, followed by a new inward birth, that the receiving of the Holy Spirit. We see evidence of this clearly in the scriptures. Starting in Acts, the second chapter, the 37th verse, we read, Now when they heard this, that is, those whom the apostle Peter was preaching the gospel to, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, to confess Jesus as Christ is to confess Jesus as the only way that individuals may escape the penalty, their eternal penalty of sin. For Jesus is the only one who is able to cleanse one of one's sin. See, regardless of our beliefs, all are going to be raised unto judgment. We will all face God on judgment day. But the baptism is to confess our death with Christ, that he has paid for, that is the Father's justice system has paid for our sins. We are now reckoned dead indeed unto sin, and the Holy Spirit thus alive unto God. We have been made partakers of his divine nature. But unlike the man who hung next to Jesus on the cross, who through faith asked Jesus to remember him when he entered his kingdom, thereby that man showing faith in Jesus resurrection from the dead, there's no evidence of such profession by Michael Jackson. Further, the Apostle Paul instructs in the following, 1 Corinthians in the 5th chapter, beginning in the 6th verse, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven in scriptures always speaks of evil. That, therefore, the baptism, the water baptism, is showing that we are putting away evil. We are putting away the natural man, the first Adam, and becoming partakers of the divine nature, which has no evil. See, sincerity and truth. See, one who has Christ acknowledges that truth. That is to be sincere. You don't leave it up to other individuals to guess, and what, is he a Christian? Am I a Christian? You guess. It's a guessing game. That's not sincere. There's no truth in that. You would open your mouth. You would let other believers know. You would let the world know that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the only way that men are going to be raised from the dead. And all men shall face him on judgment. And he is the only way through his spirit that you can become a partaker of his divine nature. That's the Christian faith of which there's no evidence of in the life of Michael Jackson. Paul said, I wrote unto you an epistle, not the company with fornicators yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For them must ye needs go out of the world. See, one cannot look at Michael Jackson and say, well, because he participated in this world, he wasn't a Christian. And that's what Paul is saying here. But it's the evidence that you are a Christian which is lacking. There's no profession of faith. All right. Further, Paul tells us that we are able to judge what a fornicator is. What somebody who is covetous is, somebody who is an extortioner. We are able to judge these things. We're able to judge those who are idolaters. All right. And Paul is not saying that you're not able. You're not saying that you cannot associate with them. Of course, you have to associate them. We're in this world. But what he's saying is, you are not one of them. You don't have to participate with them, though you associate with them. See, to be separated from this world is not to hide from the world and its activities. 
neither does it mean that we ought to lead the way in that which brings no glory to God. If you are promoting idolatry through the worship of one through musical talent, instead of bringing worship to God, well, that's a form of idolatry. The Apostle Paul says we are able to judge, okay? He goes on to say, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. See, if he was a professing Christian, which he was not, but anybody who is a professing Christian, who is a fornicator, covetous, an idolater, a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. Paul's saying, there's no issue with you hanging out with those who are doing those things. You don't partake of them. But we're to be a light unto them. We're to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if a brother, if there is a professing Christian who's partaking with those things, we have nothing to do with them. Okay? And he goes on to tell us, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judge it. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. See, God is the one who is going to judge all men. And professing individuals, those who claim to have Christ, we are to judge. See, it's not that we are judges, it's the word of God that has already judged. There's no escaping the truth of God's word. Fornication is fornication. Idolatry is adultery. Idolatry is idolatry. Covetousness is covetousness. I didn't judge these things. Paul wasn't the one that was judging these things. The Word of God was the judge, and we have the Spirit of God, which is the Word, who is made flesh, who is Christ, whom Spirit we have. Paul says about those believers professing, but are walking according to the flesh, Deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. But what is he really teaching us here? He's saying the spirit, which is in truth the breath of God placed in every man. That is the spirit. No man is alive but by the grace of God. And yet, it is the soul of man which is going to be judged. Every man's soul shall stand before the judge. See, the flesh returns to dust. The spirit returns to God, and the soul of man is judged by God. So Paul is saying, he who is a professing Christian, okay, but yet is walking according to the pattern of this world, the lust of the flesh, delivers such a one unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh, the re, that is, the releasing of a spirit unto God that his soul might stand in judgment. Paul is preaching a judgment day where all men shall be judged. See, Jesus gave up his spirit, as we see, look, in Luke, the 23rd chapter, the 46th verse. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Jesus gave up his spirit, but his soul went into the heart of the earth and his body went to the tomb until that resurrection day, that we might become partakers of his divine nature, thus escaping the wrath to come. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man was made a quickening spirit. And whosoever will believeth upon him shall be made a partaker of that spirit. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. It's not about what you can do, but it's about what he can do. It's not about you having to live up to a particular standard, but it's the fact that he has lived up to the standard, and he enables you through making you a partaker by his spirit. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Now what's he talking about in the spirit? See, there are other spirits, there are spirits of the world, just as there is his spirit. There is the heavenly spirit, and there is the spirit of this world. And he's saying, let us cleanse ourselves from the flesh and spirit, the spirit of this world, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. It's by faith that you become a partaker of the divine nature. It's not your works. Your works fall short. 
That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to profess Christianity. That's what it means to be a brother, a biblical Christian. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. The gospel of your salvation. You're saved by the gospel, by what Christ has done. It's God's justice system. And who also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. God has given us the spirit, those whosoever have believed. God bless.